Master Your Mindset Radio, Episode 51. Welcome to Master Your Mindset Radio, the show where we empower you to conquer limiting beliefs and transform your world with your gifting and purpose. Now for your host, Elizabeth Nader. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode. So happy to have you here. I need to give you guys some background as to the special person that I have the honor of interviewing today. Many of you have been involved in the Flatten Your Fear Summit. I know so many of you have been watching those daily emails with videos from amazing people have overcome odds and told their story. And I opened that summit on August 1st with Damon West. Now this was really exciting for me and for our team because it was just a little over a year ago that he came out with his book, The Coffee Bean. And if you don't have it yet, you've got to get it. But he co-wrote that with one of my favorite authors, John Gordon. And it was really the result of an incredible life story whereby he ended up with a life uh, sentence in prison and the coffee bean was truly the metaphor the story that that took him through his experience in prison and one that he shared with the world after he got out well he also wrote another book around the same time uh, which is called the change agent and this is the story of his life and so in reading those books and interviewing him i have to tell you that one thing i kept thinking about was his mother. I kept thinking about this woman who he talks about often who stood by this young man as she watched him make tough choices, who stood by him as he ended up going to prison for drug use and burglary. And you've got to get that book too because the story is is just incredible. And as I spoke with him, I couldn't get out of my mind, I need to talk to his mom. Like this woman is a hero to me. I am a mother of four. They're teenagers right now. And I think I'm in that position where anytime I I hear about a story of a mother who faced unbelievable situations with their children and did it with grace, with humility, with the love of God, I am just transfixed and I want to learn from that person. So that is a long introduction to tell all of you why I'm so excited to have on the podcast with me from Texas, one of my favorite states. Damon West's mother, Jeannie West. Jeannie, welcome to my podcast. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth. I'm very excited and, and honored to be here. Well, I was so thrilled when you when you said yes. It just occurred to me, you know, you sent me an email after his interview, and then I, I read the email and I thought, wait a minute, I want to talk to this woman. Like, I, I need to learn from her, right? And that's what women do for each other, I think, especially mothers is that our stories encourage and our stories help each other and that's what's important so we want to dig into this we want to understand your life your family and of course we'll get to all of the things with Damon but let's paint the picture for everybody about the West family because I know you and your husband have been married a long time you have other boys so tell us about um, how you and Bob met and how you started your family Okay, uh, Bob and I met at Lamar University, and well, at the time it was Lamar Tech, and I was a cheerleader at Lamar, and he was a sports writer covering a basketball game. He saw me cheering, uh, asked a friend if he knew me. The guy said yes, so he fixed up a blind date, and we started dating, and um, that was in December of 1966, uh, I think, and we married in um, June of 1968. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So it started on a blind date. Right. I love it. I love it. And you were both Texans? No, he's from Missouri. Ah. He had transferred from the University of Missouri to go to Lamar to play golf. Okay. And at the time, Lamar had a really good golf team. So he didn't make the team. He had like a a two handicap, but uh, it wasn't good enough for the team. So he started writing sports. Right, exactly. And of course, he's well known for that. And and we'll talk about that later because he's had a a great career. And I know that he is uh, very respected in in, in that field. So you guys, yeah, you guys got married. And um, shortly thereafter, when did you start having, you ended up with three boys. When did you start having children? 
Well, when we got married, I still had a year of college left. So I finished, got my degree in home ec, taught school. And our first child was born in um, July of uh, 1972. And then Damon was born in October of 1975. And Grayson was born in December of 1980. Okay, so three boys. Uh-huh. And you have one of the important things about your personality, I think, in your giftings uh, is that you chose to be to go into the nursing field. And uh, when did you start that? Did you stay home with the boys or did you actually start that early? I actually I, I taught school. And then after that, I did uh, I worked for the Convention and Visitors Bureau in Port Arthur, Texas. And after Grayson was born, um, he was six months old, and my mother was a registered nurse and actually wanted to retire and felt like the only way she could retire was if she had something else to do. And I had always said I wanted to go back to school to be a nurse, and she said, well, I'll take care of your kids till you graduate. Oh. So I had two and a half years to go to get my bachelor's in nursing and started nursing school in um, 1981. Wow. Okay. What was it about yes. nursing that attracted you? I got it from my mother, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, she was an RN, and when she died, she had been an RN for 50 years oh. and had maintained her license that long. Wow. That's incredible. So, yeah, it is, it is. And many of my cousins have, have gone into nursing also because of the example from my mother. Oh, how wonderful. What was her name? Louise. Okay, Louise. Uh, Louise Monti, M-O-N-T-I-E. Nice. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, one big aspect of what Damon talks about, certainly in his life story, is is faith, and that being ever present in your family. Were you and Bob both on the same page with your faith, and was that something that was there in the beginning of your marriage? Bob, Bob is uh, went to ba- the Baptist Church and has never converted to Catholicism or anything. He continues to be a Baptist, but does not go to the Baptist church. Got it. And when he does go to church, it's uh, Easter and Christmas. And he goes, <laughs> he goes to mass with me, but he's, he's a good man. And uh, he's friendly with the priest at, at St. Elizabeth uh, church in Port Natchez, where I go. Yeah. And when they see him, they all know it's a holiday. So, oh, I love it. But, but he has, he has a, a, a faith. He really yeah. does. Yeah, he does pray. Yes. Well, Southern Baptists are a special kind. I know they are. They are. I know many of them. (laughs) And, um, you know, your Catholicism has been obviously very important to you. I I married a Catholic as an evangelical. So I understand. I have Uh we have a similar mix. And uh, at the end of the day, the most important thing is that you know, is, is what we believe and, and how it, that drives our life. So you raised exactly. your, yeah. So you raised your boys with faith in the household, right? They were raised Catholic. That okay. was one of the things that he promised when we got <laughs> married, any children we had would be raised Catholic. And he kept his promise, took them to CCD, made sure they got up for mass on Sunday they were all three were altar boys. They had a good foundation. And I think that's clear when you, you know, Damon talks about that. He's, I, I came from a great family, he says often. And you, it's pretty clear when you, when you read his story that he had sort of all the advantages that love and faith and security. And of course, no one is perfect. No family is perfect. But all those are big advantages for children. So in the, for the most part, would you say that his his growing up years were were fairly stable and fairly happy? They were. Yeah. Um, at one point, as, as this happens at times, we were married 17 years and uh, we separated for a year. Okay. And that was during the time that uh, I was a nurse by then and uh, I was working lots of hours, anywhere from 12 to 16 hours a day and worked at night because I had just graduated from nursing school and we had a babysitter and that's when things changed mm. with the babysitter. Yeah, right. And how old was Damon at that time? He was nine. And Jeannie, is that the babysitter that Damon had? Yes. Okay. Th- that molested him. Okay. Um, she, I, I, we didn't know anything was wrong until uh, I came home one day and 
there was a hole in the wall and our oldest son had put his fist in the wall through the wall and um he was upset because the babysitter wouldn't unlock the door and had damon in the room with her Mm. and she came highly recommended we vetted her very well it's just something that happened that you know we had no clue and when all was said and done we did go to the police and we went to we saw a doctor and we we went to the priest and we saw a counselor and we were told by all of them number one he's a boy don't worry about it it's a good thing it wasn't a girl oh and two by the time he would get to court because they weren't filming then like they do now Mm -hmm. uh doing video and they didn't have people trained to do the verbal exam on them Uh, But anyway, they said, you know, um, he would be older and he would be hard to believe. Wow. Uh, So we did what we could. You did what you could. You did what you knew to do. And and the tools tools weren't given to you at that time like they would be now. Exactly. Absolutely. So that happens. You guys are separated. But then, of course, you know, we know you've been married 52 years. So obviously, obviously the marriage is healed and you come back together. We we did. We went to a campus crusade for Christ uh, marriage encounter and uh, went, you know, Bob moved back home and uh, we started our life over. So. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yes. So now Damon is probably, let's go into high school. And, uh, you know, from from what I've read, he was very good at football, obviously, very a star quarterback, right? And yes. um, Bob was a sports writer. And sports is a big part of your life, right? Exactly. Okay. So that experience in high school with him, uh, how would you how would you talk about that? What was it like in the household? What was it like being his mother? Was he pretty much following the rules and, and doing what you and Bob expected of him? We thought he was. Yeah. <laughs> but obviously he wasn't. Yeah. There's uh, he he missed some classes. He would get to school late sometimes. He would leave on time. Bob would take him. Uh, but sometimes would leave school not a lot but sometimes we found these things out later yeah we found out a lot of things later we thought everything was fine and you know nobody complained the teachers didn't complain uh the neighbors didn't complain we we didn't have people didn't call us and say your you know your kids acting out or you have we're having this problem uh he got along with the coaches we had no clue you had no clue that those seeds had st- had started, those things exactly. had started. Exactly, exactly. When you look back now, of course, it's easy to look back and see all that. Do you think that the molestation had had something to do with his starting to kind of go sideways in high school, or is that not related? No, I, th- I think it did. Uh, he had experienced some adult behaviors. Yeah. And he was nine years old and didn't have coping mechanisms That's right. to understand what was happening. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we found out later he started having sex around 12. He wow. was 12 years old. Oh. And as he says, it, he was having sex on a regular basis. Sad. Had no clue. Wow. Wow. Uh, so he's suffering really in silence. He, it, he is. And, you know, I would talk to him periodically. I would try to bring up the the situation that happened with the babysitter and he'd say mom just you know don't worry about that I'm fine it's y'all that have the problem Mm -hmm. and that seemed to be his big his coping mechanism a lot you know Mm -hmm. when we'd ask anything or try to check up it would be hey I don't have a problem you do oh interesting if you if you were back there today what is what would you do differently I mean, besides what the authorities did and all of that, because that wasn't handled like it should have been as it is today. Right. But, but as his mother, do you have any advice as to maybe different things you would have done? Or do you feel like you could do everything that you, you know, having the knowledge you had at the time? I think having the knowledge that we had, we did what we could. And what we were, we we listened to the people that we thought knew best. And yeah. those people were doing what they thought was best right uh now if it happened now we would be more aggressive on therapy and uh try to get to the bottom of everything yeah uh more counseling because the 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 seeds that were planted just started to take root without without you guys even necessarily 
knowing and I think a lot of times when someone is a high performer like Damon it's easier to hide that right because you hide behind, oh, yes. behind the success that he was having especially in football popular kid all of those things can hide the pain that he's going through exactly and his grades were good I yeah. mean there was no slipping of grades all the things that you look for he was he was drinking uh, he was smoking cigarettes we found he was smoking marijuana, but we we didn't know. I mean, we didn't have a clue. Right, right. So then he graduates, and uh, star quarterback ends up going to college. So what was, from, from mom's viewpoint, what were his college years like that you saw? His first year uh, playing football, he, uh, he was redshirted his first year, mm -hmm. and his grades were very good. He, he won the trophy for the best uh, grade point average. Uh, on the football team uh, with incoming freshmen mm. and uh, with Rick, Rick as a rookie. And, you know, other than, I mean, he didn't come home a lot because he, he was, he said he was uh, working on football and doing this and that. We went to the games uh, every Saturday. Uh, we would, Bob would buy the tickets ahead of time. And I think we got our tickets for like, uh, fifty dollars round trip from mm. uh, from the Houston airport uh, from Hobby to to Dallas, and we flew in. Uh, he was going to school in Denton at the University of North Texas, so we attended all the home games. And his first year there, we attended many of the uh, away games. We went to Oklahoma and Missouri, and there were several other places. But we we tried to keep in touch with him. And at the same time, our our two other children went with us. So right. it was a family thing. Right, right. And, he and had it, lots of support. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Again, when you hear all of that, you recognize that he was fully supported by, by a loving family. But when you're reading his story, you know that, you know, he's suffering and, and, right. and starting to make even more serious choices. Now, you know, I want to obviously get to kind of the... Uh, you know, the crux of all this with, with eventually what happens, but people need to understand that he eventually is injured, right? And it ends his, his football career. He had two injuries. One was a separated shoulder. He recovered from that, went into spring training, did very well. And then that summer, uh, he was taking a shower, put the, um, the towel on the towel rack in the apartment he was in, the towel rack broke away from the wall and there was a piece of porcelain that bounced in the tub, splintered and severed his Achilles tendon. Oh my gosh. And so it was hanging by a thread and that was a career ending injury. Right, absolutely, that's tough. So, and, and it was, yes. And that's a turning point too, when, when athletes exactly. have things like that. That's, that's rough to, to accept and, and, and painful physically but also also mentally now when he eventually you know goes out into the world and as you read his story and I'm, I'm fast forwarding through things though but I want you to mm -hmm. tell us what it was like as his mom he eventually decides to go to DC he loves politics he gets involved with Dick Gephardt and eventually that leads him to DC this that part of his career and those choices uh, we know when you read the story that some things that were going on that were not good, but what are you seeing as his mother right now and what is your relationship like with him at this point? Well, we, you know, we would talk on the phone a lot. Uh, I knew that he was having a, a, an issue with substance abuse and I learned that from Brandon, our oldest son. Mm. And he and Brandon talked and they decided they were, Brandon was going to go with him and help him get settled in D.C. Because Brandon had worked there before. Mm. Uh, he did an intern with Jack Brooks in the uh, early 90s. And so uh, he and Damon went to D.C. and Damon was drug free until the very, uh, very end of his time there. And then he, he when uh, Gephardt dropped out, Damon moved to uh, to Austin. So at, at that point, well, actually, Gephardt was still running, and after he moved to Austin, he dropped out, and that's when Damon moved to Dallas, and his whole world fell apart. Well, that's where it gets really intense. So now he's in Dallas, and he's now in the financial industry, 
and we have the introduction of meth. Right. Which is rough, which is by anyone who's been through it, anyone that talks about it, it's just a, a, a real dark hole that he that he entered. And are you seeing that or do you just know that something isn't right? I know he talks in the book about avoiding your calls, having them go to voicemail, kind of just put, you know, positioning himself like something else is going on, but eventually he can't really hide this, can he? He did a good job of hiding it. Hmm. Uh, we didn't go back and forth to Dallas a lot because I was working and Bob was working. Right. And uh, he did come home a few times. He came home for Christmas mainly, uh, but because he he told us he was working, mm-hmm. and but I was concerned. The only thing I would do different at this point, if if it was at that time, I think we would have made trips to Dallas, yeah, to check to see for ourselves, right? Because but he, we took him at his word. Well, he it you get that feeling that he's able. You know, it's 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 a it's a talent, right? In some ways, to be able to pres- oh, yeah. to present a, a certain front, and I, I think his love for you, probably because you can pick up his love for his parents and, and for you throughout the book. But it's like enough that he wants you to believe everything's okay, right? He doesn't actually want to hurt you. Our kids, I don't think, want to do that. But the degree to go that they go to present a good front and uh, want you to think everything is fine. But you have this gnawing feeling right like something's not right absolutely yes yeah Yeah. so now to those listening who don't know the story yet and I I really hope you read the book because even though I knew the story the book was a page turner but now things are getting worse and worse with the addiction uh to the point where you know he's obviously at work high and and um now it turns into an issue of needing more money and of course I'm I'm shortening all of that, but he turns into also, frankly, uh, a burglar. I mean, I, I, that's what he does. He starts breaking into homes, starts breaking into apartments with other people to find money to fuel the drug habit. When he lost his job, were you not aware? Did you not know that it was getting to that point? We we knew he he lost his job, and we and he told us it was because he didn't pass the test mm. to be a stockbroker. Right, you had to take a, a a test, and you had one shot at it, and he and he did not score high enough. So we knew he was going to be let go, and we offered for him to come home, and he could stay with us, and uh, you know. If he needed help getting a job, we could help him get him back on his feet. But he kept saying no, that, you know, he was fine, that uh, he was uh, doing other things in in Dallas. He was driving a limousine. He was doing this. He was doing that. Uh, He was bidding on storage units. You know, Mm -hmm. when when storage units, people don't pay their bills, they offer, they auction them. Right. And he was and he said he was doing very well. He was telling us a half truth there. Yeah, he wasn't bidding on them. He was breaking into them. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Unbelievable. Yes. 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 That's right. Wow. And your other it was it Grayson who was with him for a while. Who was yes. Gray, yeah. Gr- yes. Gray Brandon at that point stayed in D.C. when uh, when Damon came back. Brandon stayed, and uh, he was working at one point for the National Arboretum. Brandon has a degree in public relations from the University of Texas and worked there and then uh, became a a restaurant manager on Capitol Hill. So he had a really good job and he met his his future wife there. And so he stayed on in in DC. Okay, so it was Grayson who also got into some addictive behavior with Damon, right? He did. Yes. Okay. Yes. So let's go to you for a second. As a mom, what are your prayers like? Because at this point, um, moms know there's something not right. It's not right. It's off. You've got that gnawing feeling in your stomach. How are you giving that to God? How are you not just feeling like you have to step in and and do something? With Damon, you couldn't just step in. Mm. Uh, we did have people tell us, you know, well, you ought to go over there and, and uh, rescue him. Mm. Well, you can't take a, a grown person, 30 years old, nope. kidnap him and bring him home. Nope. Uh, but I did pray a lot, and I used to pray that he'd be safe. 
and that whatever he was doing, he would stop and, you know, things like that. And eventually I just started praying that God let him save his soul. Yeah. And um, I would drive to work. I, we lived out in the country at that point, and I, I was working at St. Elizabeth Hospital in Beaumont. And it was a 45-minute drive, and I would say the Chaplet of Divine Mercy while mm. I was driving in my rosary. And then, and when you say praying, I was screaming to God. Oh, wow. That uh, because, you know, I was so frustrated trying to understand what was happening, trying to give it to God, because, you know, they say, if you pray, don't worry. If you worry, don't pray. Right, right. So I was trying to give it to God, and I just finally said, God, just let him save his soul. And honestly, within months of changing the way that I was praying, and I know everybody has their own way of praying, right. but he was arrested. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, and as he says, he was rescued. That's the moment, the conviction, the arrest, the whatever, the life-saving yes. moment, the life-saving right. moment with the Dallas, you know, police. With, with the, the SWAT team. Yes, yeah. The SWAT team came in. Right out of a movie, but, but saved, it was. His life, saved his life. So your prayers as a mother shifted from kind of getting him out of this, whatever, to just save his soul, like almost just giving him back to God. Like he's it, your... I, I had to. Yeah. Yes. Wow. That takes a lot of strength, Jeannie. Yeah, it well, you know, I, I watch, you know, you at the beginning, you were talking about how mothers help us yeah. and mothers sometimes show us the way. My mother uh, was the mother of six children. I'm the oldest of six. Mm. And my uh, my oldest brother, I have one sister who's a year younger than me. And then my brother, Philip, was a year younger. So she had three of us in, in, in two years, all in March. Wow. And uh, my brother, Philip, went to Vietnam, came home. He was with the 101st Air, uh, Airborne Division and died in a skydiving accident in oh. Antioch, California in oh. 1971. Oh, my gosh. So I watched my parents go through with all they went through first, you know, with him being in Vietnam and then making it home when, when some of our other friends' children did not. Right. And then to see him go through what he went through when he got home and then to go to Antioch or to go to California, he was working for Bay Cable. He started, he and another guy from here started the Bay Cable Vision mm. in Oakland. Wow. And uh, he was skydiving on a weekend, just oh. routine stuff. Wow. And landed in a water hole on a golf course and drowned. Oh my gosh, Jeannie. And he was a an ex he was a jump master, an excellent swimmer, but I guess he might have gotten entangled in the chute when it went on the water uh, underwater. And they pulled him out, re, went to resuscitate him. Uh he we talked with witnesses at the scene. They said at one point his color returned. The fire department showed up. They put a demand valve resuscitator uh, on him, which was used at the time. It was normal yeah. uh, protocol. And with a demand valve, you dive, di uh, dial up how many cc's you want to use when mm. you're putting air into the lungs. Yeah. And his he blew out both lungs. Oh, my gosh. And oh. uh, But we did not understand, even though we got the autopsy report, we didn't understand that until I was in nursing school and one of my friends who worked in the emergency room, I was telling her and she said, that happens all the time. And she said, but they saw it in the emergency room and they would just put a chest tube in and the patient would be all right. Uh, but in the field, they weren't doing chest tubes in the field. I understand now that in some cases they do. Yeah, but he and couldn't be so, saved. He couldn't be no, saved. Then. He could not. No, he couldn't. And wow. so I watched my mother and daddy go through that and grieve. And they, while they loved the five, the five of us left and all five of us are still here. Mm. Um, I watched with dignity how she maintained herself and she, she never cried at home, but she would go to mass almost every morning. Mm. And then after mass, she would sit in church and cry. So mm. Wow. That happens to me on occasion. You know, you yeah. go to church and, and I know this happens to a lot of people. I, uh, 
after mass you see people in mostly moms yeah and with their shoulders shaking because they're sobbing yeah you learn to it, you give it to God and you ask him to guide you well that is the best advice but some sometimes the hardest to do because I'm sure you're, you, you know you're thinking is my son gonna die I mean I, I'm wondering if you're wondering every time the phone rings you know is this someone calling I me mean, he was playing playing with the worst people playing with the worst things, right? Like he was putting himself in those situations where he was. It, it's the it, grace it, of God that he didn't die. Exactly. Exactly. But in in that point, I think his part of his soul, I won't say the whole soul, but part of his soul was like it had died mm. because he was not looking after himself. He wasn't taking care. He wasn't doing the things he knew to do. Right. And so, like he said, he, uh, on July uh, 30th, 2008, 2008, he was rescued. He was rescued in the most yes. dra- dramatic way, sitting on a couch in an apartment and a window shatters and in rolls a canister and the SWAT team is upon him and he is arrested. Right. And you get a call from who, where, take us to your side of it. Oh, boy. I don't, you know, there's so many things that are blurry now thinking back, but I didn't hear from him for Mm -hmm. a few days, and it worried me, you know, because I I would call. He wouldn't always take my call, but I think I I got in touch with his roommate and was told that he was in jail. So then I got the name of his lawyer, and I called the lawyer, and the lawyer told me that, uh, yes, and it was serious. So we had a friend in Houston who was a federal judge, a guy that Bob went to high school with, and they moved to Texas together. They drove from the, uh, from Missouri to Beaumont to go to Lamar. Mm. And uh, so he called his friend, and the guy got all the details. His bond was set at over a million dollars, and he told us under no circumstances were we to try to get him out. Well, number one, we didn't have the money to get him out, and we didn't know, you know, you pay 10% right. and you don't get it back. Right. Well, we didn't even know that. I mean, we had no clue. So uh, Dave Dave said, you know, don't even try to get him out. So uh, eventually he did call us, and, uh, you know, we talked on the phone. Then we were able to secure a lawyer. Right. And uh, but that lawyer at the time and Damon goes through that in the book, did not believe that what he was uh, charged with was a crime, was uh, the right charge. So he really didn't defend him on that. Yeah, no, he definitely did not have. You can yeah. tell he didn't have good. But when when you finally talked to him on the phone, at what point did you realize he was one of the uptown? It's called the uptown burglars, oh, right? Yeah, I think I I, I think maybe. Dave told us that the the judge who called us back. Yeah. And then uh, I think uh, Grayson got some information for us and Damon uh, and uh, Brandon got some information for us. Then the Internet wasn't like it is now where you can just go to the, you know, the Dallas News and, right. and see what's happening. We did know some people with WFAA, which is the ABC affiliate in Dallas. Mm-hmm. Dale Hansen was a sports sports guy for WFAA, and uh, we were able to get some information from him. And piece it together. I mean, you're sitting yes. here in the dark about your son, and all. And this is big news, by the way, that they that they arrested, you know, an uptown burglar, right? I mean, they've been looking for well, him. Well, yeah, yeah, at, yes. At that time, now also too, this was July 30th. On September 13th of that same year, 2008, uh, we were staying with my cousin because we lost our house in Hurricane Ike. That's right. We had, we had six to eight feet of water in it. So my wonderful, gracious first cousin called me, Gail, and she said, come and stay with Larry and I. So we moved in with them. Mm. Uh, at that point, I was staying uh, at the hospital because we were, I was the central personnel. So we went and stayed with them for a month until we could find alternative housing. So you're dealing with a hurricane, the loss of your home, and the incarceration uh-huh. of your son all in the same period. 
all and when the hurricane hit, hit Bob Bob's mother lived with us and uh, so he took she was 88 and so he and and his mom went to to Dallas to evacuate and I went to the hospital mm-hmm. and uh, so when I, when it all came together he had to find a nursing home for her in Waco oh. because uh, she had had a stroke oh, my and so uh, he couldn't he couldn't bring her back home we didn't have a home to come back to so he put her he got with some friends and they found a place for her and then you know we would go back and forth after that uh, to visit. How are you processing all of that? I, I, I'm just like, th- this is a lot at once. It is, I, I, but I knew it was going to be okay. I mean, it was like, okay, we know where Damon is. He's safe. And uh. and that really, there was, and I've talked to other mothers who's who have been in similar situations where you don't know what's going on. Uh, and then finally they become, they get arrested and they're put in, in jail you can you can sleep at night you can breathe even though you don't really know what's happening there but you feel like they're off the street they're safe wow and so I just again put it in God's hands and I felt like um, I would not be given more than I can handle oh my gosh Jeannie well that was that was a lot and you you lost your home twice to a hurricane didn't you we we did in Hurricane Ike we had two trees that went through the roof and we built the house we had to rebuild the house Mm -hmm. and we had finished the kitchen it was eight days before the hurricane Mm. finished the kitchen on september 5th and september 13th it flooded oh my gosh oh lots a lot going on for you so now he's arrested and part of you of course there I, i i guess i can understand i don't understand it having not been through it but i can see where you would say there is a relief to knowing that he's off the streets because he was surrounded by some very dark creatures and you know he was putting himself in a lot of situations where he could have OD'd or he could have who knows what could have happened right absolutely so now the process of him being prosecuted begins so that process how long is that process do you recall um he was arrested July 30th and we went to trial in March I mean in May and it was a it he was on trial for six days and found guilty on a Friday and the following Monday he was he received the sentence of 65 years let's pause there for a second just so everybody can hear that 65 years which is a life sentence and this is for drugs and burglary nope he was never charged with drugs. Wow. He was charged in Texas. If two or more people participate in a crime, you uh, you can charge them under the organized crime statute. Okay. And that's what they charged him with. Okay. All right. And um, I think it's either two or more or three or more because they had three and then they dropped charges on one of them. Uh, but uh, he was charged with organized crime. Which is unbelievable. And you think about, I mean, the drugs didn't even come into play. It it all, it it hinged on that law that allowed them to go after him. So 65 years, which is a life sentence. So you're sitting in the courtroom for the sentencing. Did you have any, any, did you and Bob have any warning that it could be that extreme? Not at all. His, his lawyer felt like he was going to get off with probation. Oh, my gosh. And had us, you know, we received uh, his guilty plea on Friday and told us to find a, a place. So I called all kinds of uh, rehabs in the state of Texas and nearby states to get prices and if they could take him. And I had all the information ready. And then Monday we went back to court and he had uh, people testify as to his character and what kind of child he was and everything we had the state of texas did pay for a psychologist and a psychiatrist to interview him and they both said that the uh, sexual abuse Mm -hmm. at nine years old was was the precipitating factor that at that point he had no way of processing what had happened to him 
Oh. So when people think that, you know, well, it doesn't hurt anybody, it does. Oh, it does. And it stays, yes, absolutely. Oh, Jeannie, that is that is heartbreaking. So you're sitting there and they say 65 years. I, I don't even know how you're processing that. What did that feel like physically, spiritually, mentally? Uh, it's like a kick in the gut mm. physically. Uh, spiritually, I'm asking God for help. And mentally... I can't even process 65 years because that's that time I was 62. Oh. And so you're thinking, okay. And I, and we didn't know how the TDCJ or Texas Department of Criminal Justice, how this works. You get a sentence and you get time off for, for right. good time and, you know, and your parole and everything. So we had no, we had no experience whatsoever with the criminal justice system. Of course not. So you don't know that 65 years could be only seven. You have no idea it's 65. That's all you know right Exactly, then. Oh. exactly. So now in the book, and this is one of my, uh, I think one of the most moving parts of the book because I think it's a strategic time in his life. And you and I talked about this before the podcast and how he remembers and how you remember it. But the way we all see it when reading the book is that the sentence comes down you have five minutes, that's the way it's told, to talk to him. And, and Bob, his father, your husband, is, is kind of stoic and quiet and, and dealing with it in his way. And you walk into that room and tell us what you say to Damon. In my mind, I was doing emergency room and trauma nursing. Yeah. And uh, or that's my background. And so I see my son on a gurney mm. and he's bleeding to death and I have to do something to stop the bleeding. Mm. So that's my thought process. And so I told him that, you know, we love him. We'll, we'll stick with him. We'll do whatever we can. But that when he goes to prison, um, he will, he will, we want him to come home as the son that we raised or don't come home at all. Wow. Wow. And that include, and that included not doing certain things, right? In prison. Yes. Yeah, we we uh, we asked him not to get any tattoos because the hospital where I worked, we had the contract for the prison. So we had a lot of uh, young men that came through the emergency room and a lot of them ha had tats all over their head, all over their face, you know, and I'm not against tattoos at all because I have ta cosmetic tattoos. Right. But uh, it was just the... the um, the thought of him if he ever got out coming out into the world and trying to find a job and trying to do the things that he needed to do so we asked we i told him he would not ha get any tattoos wow and he tells us now that there were times when the guys would come up and say come on damon let me let me give you a tattoo and he'd say no my mom said i couldn't get one and he said they never bothered him yeah, he talks okay. about that a lot. Yeah. I'm doing uh -huh. this because my mom said no. Let me, let me. <laughs> I, I know, of course, you've read the book because I know you guys, you know, helped oh, edit yeah. and all. And of course, you've read it many times. But a, a few things he says that you said, and, and that's how he heard it. Um, that you know, you were telling him basically, a de debts. He did this, and debts need to be paid. But they also owed you a debt because oh yes, you, you and Bob raised him with all the potential that you could give him, and you said. This is a quote. You owe us this much, no gangs. Don't you dare come back with a bunch of swastikas tattooed all over your body. Don't you dare come back as someone we don't recognize. Exactly. Amazing. Absolutely. Amazing. And the other parts of it, you know, he, in that five minutes or a very short amount of time, you also uh, re you reaffirmed the spirituality for him. And you said, you are now a captive audience to God. Wow. Right. And he, growing up, he always had uh, a plaque in his room and it was footprints in the sand. And, and that, well, actually he took a little bit of license because I, the first time we talked to him and he was in prison, I told him that, um, that you need to get on God's back. Yeah. And remember the, the, the plaque in your room, uh, footprints in the sand mm. and you let God carry you through this there will only be one set of prints wow. and the and it will be God's prints because you're going to ride on his back yeah lovely it was it was very tra it was very traumatic 
it's traumatic and and imagine that plaque in his room as his mother that's a that's an inspirational poem or story uh-huh. whatever we we all had that growing up and but can you believe that that became something that saved his life in prison because it directed his choices right and since that time um the I, with the the priest at St. Elizabeth his he had a brother in prison and so when Damon got out of prison I went to Father Shane and talked to him about about supporting uh, or starting a support group for other parents and grandparents and friends and family who had relatives in prison and they you know because like like us many people if it unless you had someone in prison you know uh, for a long time, you really don't know how to navigate the system. Of course. So we we started a group, and it's called Peeps, mm. P-E-E-P-S. Father Shane said, you can do whatever you want, but you have to call the, the group Peeps. So I said, what does it mean? He said, I don't know. Figure it out. <laughs> so it took me two weeks, and I came up with Prisoners Empowered by Enlightened Parents and Supporters. Oh, wow. And so... Uh, we would meet you know before covid we would meet once a month and it was uh, honestly a lot of grandparents who were taking care of they had raised their children and and now they were raising their grandchildren and maybe the the grandchild was in jail or in prison had been arrested and there they had young they had children so the grand the grandparents are now great-grandparents raising their their great grandchildren. Incredible what some people have to deal it, with, isn't it? Really and truly, it, wow. it, it, it is something. So I had speakers that would come in for that would talk about parole and probation and uh, recovery programs and, and different things like that. Now uh, we meet once a month on Zoom. And uh, so we have people from we have a couple from Colorado, uh, one from South Carolina and one from Michigan that have joined the the people from Texas uh, with peeps. How many people you have helped. I I think two things jump out of me about this is that, first of all, the way God made your personality and your gifts and your talents and that you chose a career that allows you to do an awesome job as a trauma nurse. You know, in that stressful situation, you go into your highest, you know, uh, performance. You know what to do and that you were able to use that when you said you looked at your son as though he were right there bleeding out and you had to use those same skills and then that that alone right there just blows me away and i think that is just god having put inside of you what you needed for a moment that you never thought you would face absolutely and then incredible right Jeannie? incredible it it is and i feel so bad i mean i i benefited from my mother's suffering and mm. uh, and that in itself is it's I'm grateful that she was able to to get, show me the way, but I feel bad for the suffering that she went through. Of course, of course, but God uses everything. He, he uses does. It he all. uses everybody. He does absolutely. And then the second thing that you did, which now in talking to you, I'm not surprised, is you go into full action. Peeps gets going. You're going to figure out how this all works. You're going to educate other people because information actually probably made you feel better. Let's figure out how this works. Let's understand the criminal justice system. Let's understand what he's going through. And of course, you didn't know any of that when that sentence was handed down. No. And we found out too, in in doing peeps, that, you know, a lot of parents will come on board and they'll say, well, my my child says this is happening and and that. And the Texas prison system, uh, the the prisons in Texas are not air conditioning, uh, air conditioned. And Right now, inside some of the prisons, it's 120, 130 oh. degrees. There, uh, some places have fans, some don't. Uh, they're supposed to get water, but because of COVID, they're locked in their cells for two hours. They're let out for one hour. They're back in their cells. Uh, it's the the suffering is horrendous, oh, and I. I'm grateful to God that Damon is on the outside during this time, 
but he is he is still working and trying to help the the guys on the inside. He well, he writes to prisoners. Yeah. Uh, he tries to keep their their spirits up. Yeah. And uh, you know we try to do the same thing with peeps. That's amazing. Now, you know, talking about the time he was in, one of the things I thought about you in reading the story, because as you go through the book, you see that the coffee bean, which we're, we won't get into because I want people to get the book and they'll understand what a big oh, yeah. deal, what a big deal that book is. A, a, you know, it's a short book, but it's life changing. How the coffee bean and you really, and the things that you said and, and, and really the family that loved him, but the things you said got him through many fights, many choices. He was able to navigate prison, but he's suffering in there. What are you thinking when you go to bed at night and you put your head on, 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 on your pillow? Your son is in prison. I, I don't understand how you were able to function. I really don't. I, I was blessed, I guess, with the ability to deal with the situation in the moment. And then, like you said, when you go to bed at night, then the world catches up with you. Yeah. And there were many times that even at work, uh, tears would come to my eyes and for the silliest things, mm -hmm. he loved Funyuns. <laughs> and when we'd go to visit him, you know, he, and we would ha we could bring twenty dollars in quarters, and we could go to the machine and get, you know, he he would get Diet Dr Pepper and Funyuns and beef sticks and different things. But nine times out of ten, when we'd visit, they were out of Funyuns. Oh. And then this, so we'd visit either on Saturday or Sunday every mm -hmm. week. Well, Monday I would go to work and pass the vending machines and they were full of Funyuns. Mm -hmm. And that those were things that, that would bring tears to my eyes or make me choke up and, you know, I'd have to turn away, yeah. um, find something else to think about. Right, right. Replace those thoughts. Because yes. I, I could imagine it would almost could drive you crazy if you focused on it too much. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. But I, I, I credit a lot of my, my nursing skills. Mm. And things that I learned in nursing school, yeah, uh, for coping. And how how is Bob coping through all of this? We we talked a lot. Mm. Uh, that his coping, he's a very good writer. And even during the year that we were separated, we you know, to for us to sit down and talk, he wouldn't talk. Mm. He he would kind of clam up. But I realized one day, how does he communicate? He writes. So I wrote him a 12 page letter and we started writing letters to each other. Oh, that's beautiful. And that, yeah, that, that kind of broke the ice. One of the things that, that we, we decided together was that we were not going to try to hide this. Hmm. And one of the things that Bob did after he was sentenced was he wrote a story, uh, for the, the Port Arthur news, he, uh, his Sunday column. And he wrote about all the things that we had gone through. In fact, you could probably find it on the internet. It's mm. um, um, look for Bob West, and it was written in May of uh, 2009, I think, mm. May or, or June in 2009. But anyway, the column went all over the world because it was picked up by the Associated Press. And uh, we had people calling us or emailing from all over the country uh, asking about Damon and telling us about their children. But he wrote a column about what we were going through, how our friends and family had st stood by us and were supportive in the cards that, that we received. Wow. And he talked about one particular card that we got from my, my sister-in-law's mother and her husband. And it was about, you know, you can't hear the cacophony of people who are praying for you mm. and that that really uh touched bob because he put that in his column oh that's so sweet and I, I i think what you say too is that you just said something interesting we decided not to hide it i i think there could be so much shame associated and like w did we fail as parents a shame of what Absolute, our, right oh gosh. every day you question yourself you know what did we do mm. uh what did we do wrong Wow. How how could we have done something different? How could things, how could we have changed his course? Mm -hmm. And then when you look at it, you have three kids, basically um, all from the same family, receiving the same love and attention yeah. because they all had talents in their own areas. Yeah. Uh, and 
you know, they all turned out very well in some areas and failed in others. You just don't know. No, I and I went back to thinking of my own family. You know, mm. my five, uh, my four brothers and my sister, how all six of us were different. And we had the same family. We had the same parents. You just don't know. You, you think that mm -hmm. it, it, logic says that they should all be the same, but it's, it's the same environment, but we don't know everyone has a path. And I think what was consistent and what you see in his writing was the love that your family had. And I, I want to point out that in the book, and I, I want everyone to read it because it's the, the stories in prison, I'm sure that was tough for you to read, are very detailed and, oh, yeah. and uh, unbelievable. But, but, you know, your presence when he went in and what happened there in those five minutes, and of course, I'm sure all of the visits, but then when he gets out, when he, he gets paroled at uh, seven years, three months. Is that right, Jeannie? Yes. Seven years, yes. three months. When he gets paroled and you pick him up with Bob at, at in prison, there's another moment, another Jeannie moment, because these moments for me, I'm like, this woman, I, I want to give you an award, <laughs> like a you know mother of the year. I don't know. So there's another Jeannie moment where you sit in the car with him or something. You, you don't leave yet and you say three things to him. Do you remember all of that? Yes. Tell us about that. Uh, well, we were told when we got, we, we were given instructions on how to go about picking him up. So anyway, he comes out. We were told not to get out of the car. Of course, we both did. But we didn't run to him. He ran to us. Oh. We got in the car and he said, he said, start the car, get, you know, go, go. Because it's like you're just waiting for someone to come and say, oh, we made a mistake. Uh, anyway, I said, no, we have, we, I have some things for you. And I gave him a, uh, his cell phone, a cell phone. I had an uh, iPhone that I gave him. Uh, it was one that I had for several years. And like he says, the phones that when he went into prison had still had buttons on them. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I gave him the phone and I already programmed all the numbers in it that he would need. Yeah. So he could call everybody. And uh, the I gave him his driver's license mm. and that was a big thing because when he went in, uh, during the time he was in prison, his driver's license had expired sure. and that's a big thing to try to get your driver's license reinstated. Yeah. But Damon is very resourceful. And when he was in, um, uh, at the Kyle unit, they had transferred him for a rehab program. Uh, he found out that in Texas, if you're in prison and you're fixing to get out, you can renew your driver's license. Mm -hmm. So we had to go through that. I had to find his old license, go through things that, you know, we had to go to Dallas after everything and pick yeah. up his belongings. Yeah. Anyway, we had his driver's license. So, uh, we used that. And then the third thing was, um, while in prison, he participated in ax retreats Yeah, and the ax brothers, uh, the ax, people who participated in retreats have a very distinctive bracelet that they wear and it's fish fish hooks mm. and um so because you become a fisher of men right and so i gave him uh his axe bracelet and his driver's license in his phone well it, it's moving to read this and i i want to read one more time because this is what he says after you talked to him, uh, the third thing was the axe bracelet. And he says, I was speechless. How in the world did I get so lucky in this life? I knew long ago I had won the parental lottery, but my mother had just raised the bar on unconditional love and knowing exactly what I needed in life. Through my tears, I said, thank you, mom. I love you so much. I hugged her and then hugged my father too. I love you too, dad. Let's go home. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I got it. I'm crying at this point reading this. <laughs> like, who is this woman? So, um, obviously, going home isn't so easy when you've been in prison, but he gets to go home and start adjusting in, you know, with the love of, of the family and all of that. And of course, now, for those that have followed him, we know eventually the Coffee Bean book comes out, and there's so much else happening besides, uh, you know, the change agent and books to follow. But, I want you to just say, having lived through all of this, and there's so many small stories we don't even have time to get into, I'm sure that you could share, but if there's somebody listening right now, which I'm sure there is, who's struggling with a child, whatever age that is, with the choices they're making, who's scared, who's worried, who's concerned, 
who's feeling maybe shame, remorse, guilt, did they do what they needed to do? What, what advice, if you could just put your arms around that woman right now, what advice would you give her? I would tell her not to uh, hold it in, yeah. to seek help, that there are many people out there and more than you can ever imagine who are going through the same thing that you're going through. And each one in their own way desires to help someone else get through it because as Damon defines a servant leader, you when you become a servant leader, you profit by those that you've helped. When you're helping someone, then you don't think so much about your problems. Mm. And uh, I would say that, you know, if anybody's going through that, find, find a group, uh, go to church, uh, go to your church, go to your um, community center or, you know, go online, but find people who are going through the same thing you're going through. And there's many people that are willing to help guide you and navigate the system. And would you, if you went back to uh, Jeannie 10, 15, 20 years ago, would you tell her anything? Would you say anything to the younger Jeannie right now? Uh, I would I would say that, that we need, we, sh we should have gotten help, mm. more help at the time, that yeah. we had no clue that there were people out there that, we're going through some of the same things. Yeah. And especially after Damon was sentenced and, you know, this was, a, there's a Texas uh, news network uh, that uh, comes on every day and, and gives the, the, the Texas news. And when I was staying with my cousin after uh, Hurricane Ike, the news came on and they gave great details and, uh, one of the uh, reporters from WFAA had gone into the prison to interview Damon. Mm. And um, I got, you know, I saw him behind the glass and, and you know, um, he was professing his innocence at the time. Yeah. Uh, but he was still coming down off the, the meth. Wow. wow. And uh, so I did, by, by seeing that newscast, because my cousin got that channel, uh, I was able to see that, and that was very, uh, very awakening. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's humiliating, you yes. know, when you see go through it. And we found out that so many people. I, we got phone calls and notes and things saying my my son has been in prison and he's in Amarillo, and our family doesn't know, and our neighbors don't know, oh. and his car's still in the driveway, but we tell him he's working out of the state. Oh boy. You know, things like that, that, um, and, but when you hide things like that, it just festers inside and it, and it makes it worse. It makes it you worse. You need to come out and, and talk. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have to tell you, Jeannie, that you may not realize really how many lives you have touched. I mean, maybe the ones through peeps and things you've heard, but just by the fact that God knew that Damon needed a mother and a father like, like you and Bob, and the fact that you were able to influence him so deeply on the way in and on the way out. And I know that, you know, for all of us, life is a continual challenge. And, and I know that Damon is trying to be the coffee bean every day of his life, but you played a huge role in that. And I, I hope that I know you're a humble woman, but I hope you understand that that is an amazing call of God on your life. And I just want to honor you for being that mother. And I pray that I can be as strong as you with whatever is in front of me in my own life. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, again, I give thanks to my mother for showing me yeah. how to not, how, how to get through it. Yep. Yep. That's absolutely true. I think women, we all need to look to each other and, and support each other that way. Absolutely. Thank you, because this was just so exciting for me. You have blessed me and many other people who are listening. And I just thank you so much for doing that and for being one of these women that we can point to, your strength, your faith, your depth, and everything that you've done with your life. I'm just uh, thrilled to be able to know you. Well, I appreciate. Thank you. And, and I appreciate 
what you did for Damon. Uh, that interview was one of the best I've seen with him. Uh, you were very prepared for that, and you were very prepared for this one. Well, Jeannie, if his so. mother said if his mother says that, then I can just quit now because that is the <laughs> highest accolade I could ever get. So thank you, Jeannie. Thank you so much. Sending lots of love from New Jersey to Texas. I thank you thank for being you. who you are, and hopefully sometime we'll talk in the future. And thank you for blessing my audience. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, Jeannie. And guys, we will see you online throughout the week. Don't forget to catch the end of Flatten Your Fear. Go to flattenyourfear.com. God bless. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to Master Your Mindset Radio. Before you go, if you want to be part of a free online community of like-minded individuals for support, resources, and inspiration as you conquer your limiting beliefs and pursue your purpose, go to elizabethnader.com slash community. That's elizabethnader.com slash community. Or search for Master Your Mindset Academy private group on Facebook. Looking forward to seeing you online.